Now this week we're looking at immigration in mid 19th century Canada. We're looking at the case of the Irish. And the Irish are a really interesting case because they, they, they do two things that we can really quickly and visibly recognize. One is they come in large numbers, and so that makes them noticeable. Uh, people see that they're coming into the colonies. And, and secondly, they represent a new group of people coming into the colonies. We've seen in past weeks that there's been a, a long-standing antipathy between Catholics and Protestants, particularly between France and Britain, but that, that carries over in the colonies between French Canadians and English Canadians, between Catholics and Protestants. The Irish, for the most part, not all of them, but for the most part are Catholics, and so we see that pattern enhanced and altered in a fashion, because these people represent a new force. They speak English, most of them do anyhow, some of them still speak Gaelic, but most of them speak English, and so from a linguistic perspective, they'll integrate fairly easily into the community, but from a religious perspective, they don't. In fact, that makes it kind of interesting when they're in Montreal, because in Montreal, you can kind of imagine immigrants having a choice. They can walk into Montreal and they can go, oh, I can assimilate with these people who speak English, and I speak English, or I can assimilate with these people because they're Catholics, but they speak French. So there's this kind of play at, at, at work with the Irish coming into the country. That difference marks them as, as a significant group to look at. But their sheer numbers alone are what really makes them noticeable. And certainly we see fears expressed in the middle of the 19th century that this onrush of, of Catholics into the colony will change the character of the colony and, and pose a danger to the long-term sustainability, certainly of the cultural features of the colony, but ultimately to its politics and its basic constitutional framework and so on. Today, we're in St. Catharines, and this behind us here is one of the locks on the second Welland Canal. It was constructed in the 1840s, and this canal, as the modern canal does, linked Lake Ontario with Lake Erie, and therefore allowed people to travel, as we've seen in, in other instances, um, all the way from the Atlantic Ocean up to the headwaters of all the rivers at the heads of the, of the Great Lakes. Recall a few weeks ago, we looked at the importance of that at that area on the Niagara River for the fur trade, where indigenous people were coming to that place with furs that they had captured in the past year to trade with them with French and then later with British officials at that important juncture on the Niagara River and Lake Ontario. This represents that same trade route, but for larger vessels. This is how to get large Great Lakes uh, sailboats to cross from one side of the, from, from Lake Ontario over to Lake Erie. But look at the size of this canal. This is a major construction project. This is the second canal. The first canal runs a similar area. We could show you uh, photos of that so maybe in our, in our, in our, uh, our lecture uh, screenshot presentation. But this is a, this is a bigger, more, more, more dramatic construction uh, opportunity here. You can see it's built out of stone. It requires stone workers to cut all those stones, to cut them with precision. Notice that they're perfectly cut square stones. It requires these massive gates on the locks that need to be constructed from local wood. Um, and they also just plainly have to be dug. So you've got a combination of skilled work, these stonemasons and woodcutters and, and, and builders of, of large wooden objects like those gates, skilled workers like those, but also the masses of workers that would be needed just for the dredge work of literally cutting this stuff out of the earth. This canal takes four years to build and it takes thousands of workers to do so. And it's those Irish workers who are arriving in the 1840s who perform much of that labor. Much of, the, much of those people, many of those people, um, arrive in North America with very little money, most with none, uh, so they need to find wage labor. And this is exactly the kind of labor that is available to them. They can't start a farm, they don't have the capital to start a farm. They need some money, they need something to get them going in the world. And so our readings this week take us in that general direction of looking at the role that Irish immigrants played in British North America. And certainly this is one of those great roles. But what we'll see in our readings this week is that how we looked at the Irish people, how people understood the Irish people at the time, very much affects today how we think about those people. And some of our articles ask us to look at different ways of looking at those people and understanding them, um, not in the same way that they were understood in the same 19th century, but in ways that we can understand how they thought about those people and the roles that they were actually fulfilling.